I'm Mansoor Madani, Chairman, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery at Capital Health System in Trenton, New Jersey, and Associate Professor of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery at Temple University, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I have been giving lectures on the subject of pain management, narcotic, and drug addiction, amongst many other topics for many years. One focus of my presentation on this particular subject has been to explore history of drug discoveries. It is fascinating, thought-provoking, and educational, a tale of humans' most challenging crusade to find a cure for chronic pain. It has been said that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. In other words, those who do not remember their past or who fail to learn from the mistakes of their predecessors are destined to repeat their mistakes. The history of pain management over the last 8,000 years comprises many trial and failures, many medications that were taught to do wonders and even considered to be a miracle in the past have failed and proved addictive. Many new ones were also marketed strongly but falsely leading to abuse and devastation and the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives. Opium is regarded as likely the first narcotic substance discovered at the dawn of humanity. The history of drug addiction is immensely rich and allows for tracing the long way humankind had to travel to reach our contemporary knowledge with respect to narcotic substances. A retrospective view of the drug addiction that takes into consideration the historical context while extending our knowledge also allows for a better understanding of today's problem. This report presents element of a retrospective view of problems associated with addiction to opium, morphine, and heroin over the centuries, a subject of scientific interest in contemporary toxicology. So why does this 8,000-year history of use and abuse of opium and opioids matter for successful control of epidemic of substance abuse? We will explore this in great detail and perhaps we will learn from history as not to repeat their mistake. In this series of presentation, we will explore many of the ways that human beings attempted to control pain. What are the goals and objectives of this presentation? In the first part of this lecture series, we will explore the fascinating history of recognition, discovery, use and abuse of drugs. In future lecture, we will look at the pain description, differentiation, classification, and treatments. Describe the differences between acute and chronic pain. Appropriately assess anticipated pain and recommend appropriate treatment for a patient's pain. A treatment regimen based on the type of pain, severity, and patient-specific characteristic. We will also describe the differences between analgesic and co-analgesic or adjunctive drug classes. Learn to recognize inappropriate pain management regi regimen and be able to recognize opioid-related adverse effects. So, pull up a chair, sit back, relax, and allow the next hour or so to listen to this interesting, fascinating, an illustrated history of narcotic discoveries and invention. You will hear a story of a teenager who was sent to do an uh, internship in a pharmacy and by age 21 discovered the medicine that changed the world of pain management. You will see how many wars started purely to import opium to a country and many other interesting and fascinating story that you may never, you may have not heard it before. But first, let's look at some sobering statistics. Over 250 million prescriptions are written every year for opioids, one for every adult in America to have a bottle of opioid in their hands. 
75% of heroin addicts use prescription opioids before turning to heroin. 12% of total prescription is written by dental professional. Worldwide, there are somewhere between 26 and 34 million people are abusing opioid. More than 2 million American abuse prescription opioids. In 1999, about 6,000 people died from addic addiction in the United States. Since 2000, more than 400,000 people have died from drug overdose in the United States. Let's look again and compare. Last year, 67,300 Americans died from overdose and for comparison, in the entire Vietnam War, about 58,000 U.S. soldiers died. More than 43,000 died in HIV and AIDS epidemics peak in 1995. Nearly 40,000 died of gun violence during the peak of those deaths in 1993. Nearly 55,000 Americans died of car crashes at the peak of such death in seven, 1972. Pain, oh pain, there is perhaps nothing as simultaneously useful or dreaded as pain. In many ways, pain is the ultimate teacher. It teaches us to avoid hot, sharp, and poisonous objects and many other things that could cause us harm. It alerts the body of injury and diseases, but it's also unpleasant and depending on the intensity and duration can have a drastic impact on quality of life. Anyway, we look at it. Pain is a constant companion for humanity. We have always had to deal with it and we always will continue to deal with with and try to avoid it. The topic of pain management had been much discussed in medicine of late because of opioid crisis. For a long period, opioids seemed to be the answer to the longest standing problem of how to relieve pain without putting patients at high risk of addictions. Turn out that was wishful thinking. So let's take a journey and explore the history of how humanity had tried to treat pain in the last 8,000 years and in so doing, try not to repeat the mistakes of our predecessors. Opium, which William Osler, the founder of Johns Hopkins Hospital, once called God's own medicine, sparked a full-blown epidemic as we now see it through the eyes of history. Opium is a product of a plant called Papaver somniferum. The genus Papaver is the Greek word for poppy. The species somniferum is Latin for sleep inducing. Papaver somniferum is an annual plant of a green blue color with very showy flowers, red, purple or white colored. It is started as a small seed. It grows, flowers and bears fruit. The fruit is called a pod and it only fruits once. The entire growth cycle for most variety of this plant takes about 120 days. The tiny seeds like the seed of a poppy seed roll germinates quickly in warm and sufficient moisture. In less than six weeks, the young plant emerges from the soil, grows a set of four leaves and resembles a small cabbage in appearance. The fruit is a capsule crowned by a disc formed by stigmas, commonly referred to as the king puppy, stemming from its crown-like shape on top. Its resinous latex, a milky sap extracted from the unripe fruit of a Papavera somniferum puppies, contain more than 20 alkaloids, most of which are used in the medical field. Now as analgesic, 
and sedative drugs. Medicines such as morphine, papaverin, thebane, and codeine, oxycontin, oxycodone, oxymorphone, and so on, are derived from this part of the plant. So, where does opium poppies grow? The opium poppies are best grown in hot mountainous region around the world. A key area that contributes to most of the world's production now is the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia, specifically Laos and in the Golden Crescent region in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Indeed, an estimated 704,000 acres of area planted in Afghanistan are used to mass produce poppies each year. Opium poppies go through various stages of growth, but when used to start the process of heroin manufacturing, each individual plant must be touched twice by human hands. In this process, the bulbs must be sliced with razor or other sharp object in order to bleed out the milk of the poppy. This is allowed to drip until it transformed into a brown, thick syrup. It is then collected, scraped, and sold by the pound at current market prices as precursor element. The remaining plant bulb are then cut open and scraped to be sold for their internal elements or content. Now that we know how that milky sap of unripe fruit of Papavera somniferum or opium is extracted, where does opium puppy grows and how do they extract all of that? Let's go back through the history. Let's go back six to eight thousand years ago during the Sumerians. We know that Sumerians invented writing and farming and discovered and cultivated these bright red poppy flowers that they called it Holgil or the plant of joy. How do we know that? A piece of evidence was, was found at Nippur, an ancient city of Mesopotamia, now in the southeastern Iraq, dating back to 3400 years before Christ. The evidence was a clay tablet containing a cuneiform ideogram, basically an illustrated form of communication for the use of opium by the Sumerians. The opium puppy was known in Europe at least 4,000 years ago as evidenced by fossil remains of puppy seed cakes and puppy pods found in the Swiss lake dwelling of the Neolithic age. The Sumerian that were truly enjoying the effect of um, this whole gear or plant of joy soon would pass along the plant and its euphoric effect to the Assyrians. The art of poppy calling would continue from Assyrians to ba Babylonians who in turn would pass their knowledge on to Egyptians. From then on, the ancient Persians, Greek, Indians, and eventually Chinese and Romans used opium as a panacea for all maladies or diseases. I was interested to find out how the ancient cultures, they used it. The evidence suggests that they probably infused the puppies in water, meat, or even wine to produce the analgesic tea. An ancient Greek writer wrote, a puppy is boiled in water and consumed for insomnia. The same juice is used for the face. When the head of the puppies are boiled with the leaves, the juice is called meconium and is a lot less potent than opium. Once opium cultivation spread to the ancient Greek, Persia, and Egypt, a trade war began. In 1300 BC, in the capital city of Thebes, in Greece, as well as Egypt and Persia, they began cultivation of opium tebacum, grown in their famous poppy fields. 
these empires probably used the opium poppy as poppy latex as medicine. Around 1333 to 1324 BC, the Greek author Homer referred to opium's healing power in his book of Odyssey. Evidence from ancient Greece indicate that opium was consumed in several ways, including inhalation of vapor, suppositories, even medical uh, politics um, like today's patches placed on the skin. It was even used in combination of many other substances uh, with hemlock for suicide. From the earliest find, opium has appeared to have ritual significance. And anthropologists have speculated ancient priests may have used the drug as a proof of healing power. In Egypt, the use of opium was generally restricted to priests, magicians, and warriors. Its invention is credited to Tooth, and it was said to have been used for treatment of headaches at, the, at that time. The opium trade flourished during the reign of Tutmos IV and also during the reign of King Tutankhamen. The opium trade route included the Phoenician located on the eastern Mediterranean and Minos, a civilization during Bronze Age on the Isle of Crete, who moved the profitable items across the Mediterranean Sea into Greece, Carthage, a seaside suburb of Tunisia's capital, and into Europe. As the medicinal value of opium started to be understood and its calming, sedative, and hypnotic effect discovered, many terms used to describe opium over the centuries that follows its initial, its initial discovery. They called it the milk of paradise, fruit of, God, fruit of the gods, the destroyer of grief, the seductive puppy, the hands of God, God's own medicine. Now we can call it and its byproduct the destroyer of life in many cases, if not used properly. On the other side of the world, on the American continent, independent of knowledge of findings in the rest of the world, South American indigenous people have chewed coca leaves which contain alkaloids such as cocaine for thousands of years. Coca leaf remains have been found with the ancient Peruvian mummies. In about 1100 BC, on the island of Cyprus, the people of the sea crafted surgical quality culling knife to harvest opium, which they would cultivate, trade, and smoke before the fall of Troy. Many years later, around 460 to 357 BC, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, recognized opium's usefulness as a narcotic and styptic and anti-hemorrhagic in treating internal diseases, diseases of women and epidermis. He prescribed drinking of the juice of the white poppy seeds mixed with the seeds of nettle, a stinging plant to relieve pain, but he warned patient to use opium sparingly. This was the advice of Hippocrates, gave in 400 BC about opioid medication and possibility of addiction. The recent opioid epidemic has demonstrated the consequence of ignoring this ancient caution. Alexander the Great, King of Macedonia, introduced the cultivation and use of opium to Persia and India in 330 BC. He likely brought along opium on his conquest to help his soldiers fight bravely and die painlessly. Knowledge of the drug spread through those two great civilizations as he conquered and destroyed many libraries in Persopolis and other places on his way to Persia. Alexander was tutored in his youth by Aristotle, who was probably aware of opium and its many use. Despite his desire to dose soldiers with opium, Alexander's downfall may have been actually 
connected to the alcohol he discovered in Persia. From the Egyptian field to China, the opium poppy plant was not indigenous to, to Egypt, so Egyptians presumably began to cultivate the papavera somniferum plant later on, around, the Alexand around Alexandria, about 300 AD. Opium tobaccum from the Egyptian field of Tebes was first introduced to China by Arab trader around that time. In approximately 220 to 264 AD, the noted Chinese surgeon Hao Tu of the Three Kingdom used opium preparation and cannabis indica for his patient to swallow before undergoing major surgery. In Persia, Zakaria al-Razi, the father of pediatrics, was a Persian polymath, physician, alchemist, philosopher, an important figure in history of medicine. He is known for his discovery of alcohol, sulfuric acid, and classification of substances as plants, organic and inorganic plants, and elements. He was a comprehensive thinker making fundamental and enduring contribution to many fields that are recorded in over 200 manuscripts and is particularly remembered for numerous advances in medicine through his observation and discoveries. An early proponent of experimental medicine, he was the first to recognize the reaction of the eyes, uh, pupil to light, and the way the pupil react to light and accommodation, constricting when they are exposed to bright light. One of the essential methods today for evaluating a patient who may have suffered from head trauma, brain tumor, stroke, poisoning, and overdosing from a medication. It has been said in the history of medicine that Rossi was the first physician to use opium as a general anesthetic. Another Persian physician philosopher known as the most influential medical writer of the Middle Ages, is Avicenna or Ibn Sina. Avicenna's Canon of Medicine, published in 1025, is one of the most famous books in the history of medicine, present a clear and organized summary of all the medical knowledge of the time in which he separated medicine and pharmacy. It remained a medical authority for over seven centuries and it set the standard for medicine in medieval Europe and the Islamic world from the 11th to 18th century. Several hundred substances from different sources are described for the treatment of different illnesses, including a long list of anti-inflammatory and analgesic substances. He clearly described the efficacy of opium, willow oils, willow oil, corcoronium, and garlic, which even by today's standard are known to have potent anti-inflammatory and analgesic properties, as well as antioxidant. He described the effectiveness of opium in treating pain in 1025. Avicenna described opium poppy as the most powerful part of the plant causing unconsciousness in comparison to the root of the opium in his book of the canon of medicine. His book lists the medicinal effect of opium such as analgesic, hypnotic, anti-tusive effect, anti-cough, gastrointestinal effect, co uh, cognitive effect, respiratory depression, neuromuscular uh, disturbances, and sexual dysfunction. It also refers to opium's potential as a poison. Avicenna describes several methods of delivery and recommendations for those of the drugs. This classic text was translated in Latin in 1175 and later into many other languages and remained authority until the 19th century. Following Avicenna's recommendation, recommendations, physicians of the 14th century in Ottoman Empire used opium to treat um, migraine headache, sciatica, and other painful ailments. The Inquisition was a powerful 
office set up within the Catholic Church to root out and punish heresy through Europe. Beginning in the 12th century and continuing for hundreds of years, the Inquisition is infamous for the severity of its tortures and its prosecution of Jews and Muslims. Its worst manifestation was in Spain, where the Spanish Inquisition was a dominant force for more than 200 years, resulting in some 32,000 executions. During that time, opium, opium disappeared for at least 200 years from the European historical record. Opium had become a taboo subject for those in circle of learning during the Holy Inquisition. In the eyes of the Inquisition, any anything from the East was linked to the devil and punishable by death. However, by the age of discovery, 15th to 17th century, Europe had been ravaged by serial pandemics and had killed millions of people in Europe. In the 14th century, bubonic plague, a bacterial infection, killed 200 million in four years. In the 16th century, a smallpox killed 56 million people. And in the 17th century, Great Plague, another bacterial infection, killed 3 million. During this period, opium was reintroduced as a method of protecting and treating wealthy patients from pain and suffering. Recreation of, recreational use of the drug was taken up enthusiastically by citizens of the Persian Empire during the late medieval period in 1300 to 1500. Meanwhile, something interesting was happening between 1605 to 1627. Rulers of Mughal Empire became addicted to alcohol and opium by eating it. Emperor Jahangir, which means conqueror of the universe, got conquered by alcohol and opium. He was so intoxicated on the drug and wine it left him incapacitated of ruling. To this point, his wife had to fill his role. In fact, the entire Mughal family were addicted and many died from overdose of opium and alcohol. And back in Europe, in 1527, during the height of the Reformation, opium was introduced into European medical literature by Paracelsus as laudanum. Paracelsus was a Swiss physician, alchemist, and philosopher during the German Renaissance. He was a pioneer in several aspects of the medical revolution of the Renaissance, emphasizing the value of observation in medicine. He is credited as the father of toxicology. He extolled the benefit of opium and of a pill he called laudanum containing opium tincture. In 1527, he introduced black opium pill and called it stones of immortality. It was made of opium tobacco, citrus juice, and quintessence of gold, and he prescribed it as a painkiller to his patients. Paracelsus, having experimented with various opium concussions, came across a specific tincture of opium. He called it laudanum to relieve pain in liquid form. He promoted this drink mixture combining opium, wine, and assortment of mm, spices and as I said, called it laudanum, drink, meaning something to be praised, and began a long medical tradition by advertising it for use for practically every known disease. This medicine started the commercial advertisement 
for use of opium in the market. Laudanum proved to be so popular that it was used for next 400 years. Most Europeans who used opium would actually be opium drinker, opium or opium eater, consuming variation of the formula of para Paracelsius. Indeed, they were not even aware of the addictiveness of the laudanum for many centuries. To this day, laudanum remains an official remedy in the United States, although it is not um, used often and is extremely rarely used. During my lectures, I always put something funny, but in this type of presentation, I deleted many of those interesting and funny pictures. I had to keep this one in. I love this cartoon illustration of 1957 published in New Yorker magazine. Two men describe that uh, what they observe in a research, researcher's lab. That's Dr. Arnold Moore. He's conducting an experiment to test the theory that most great scientific discoveries were hit by an accident. As we see repeatedly through the history, discoveries were made by accident and in several instances leads to lead to addiction and even death. Now we are at the beginning of the 17th century. The Portuguese incursion was a crucial turning point in China's history. In fact, it would alter the course of China's history more drastically than anything that came before that time. Hong Kong and Macau are part of the Chinese territory occupied by uh, Portuguese establishment um, at that time. And it continued to be trading between 15th to 19th century. During the year 1600, Portuguese merchant carrying cargo of Indian opium through Macau and Hong Kong imported a massive amount of opium to China. Meanwhile, Persian and Indian um, societies began eating and drinking opium mixture for recreational purposes at this time. Meanwhile, in 1606, ships chartered by Elizabeth I were instructed to purchase the finest Indian opium and transport them back to England. America's significant escalation of opioid addiction is a tragedy, but it shouldn't come as a surprise. It stretches back actually to the arrival of the Mayflower in 1620. Amongst the pilgrim was a physician, Samuel Fuller, and in his kit bag, he likely carried an early form of laudanum, the mixture of opium and alcohol tincture. In the rough frontier of early America, opiate helped ease the pain brought by such ailment as a smallpox, cholera, plague, flu, pande flu pandemics, and many other diseases. Opium was still in use during the colonial era. As we know, colonial era or colonial America refers to the time in early American history from 1607 to 1776 and includes the period from colonization to the American Revolutionary War and the establishment of the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson, though generally skeptical of the medical treatment of his days turned to laudanum in his later year to help ease his chronic diarrhea. He felt so much better on the drug that he wrote to a friend, with care and laudanum, I may consider myself in what is to be my habitual state. Ever farsighted, he planted opium poppy on his property. They continued growing on Monticello until the 1990s, when the Drug Enforcement Agency or DEA pulled them all up. Jefferson died in Monticello on, of either uremia or old age. In 1676, 
Thomas Sydenham, an English pharmacist and the father of English medicine, introduced Sydenham's laudanum containing opium, sherry, and herb in 1680. He made perhaps the biggest impact on society by publishing his recipe for laudanum, sharing his discovery worldwide. Soon his product had found itself a place in almost every home. It was so well liked that his fault it was used for ailments until after the Second World War. His pill, along with other others of the time, became popular remedies for numerous ailments. In those early times and for about two hundred years there was no stigma attached to its use or report of abuse addiction or death in 1833 it was recommended for treating bee stings or persistent cough the pharmacist would tell patients to combine molasses vinegar and wine mixed with 40 drop of laudanum it could also be used on children who were teething based on his recommendation but adult also found laudanum was an easy way to get their infant and older children to sleep, especially since the side effects were little known at the time. In 1858, it was reported that one lady in New York solved her babysitter's problem by putting her children into sleep, deep, into deep sleep actually, with low denim, so he could, he could attend nightly prayer meeting. And in the 19th century, the most common opiate was laudanum. It was widely available without any prescription, of course, and it cost less than alcohol. As I mentioned earlier, the Dutch export sh shipments of Indian opium to China and the island of Southeast Asia. It was the Dutch who introduced the practice of smoking opium in tobacco pipe to the Chinese. This was the beginning of a concrete effort to lead Chinese people to become addicted to opium. An order prohibiting the sale of opium and the operation of smoking houses was issued by the em Emperor Yang Cheng in, 19, in 1729. The selling of opium for smoking purposes was now considered a crime. Opium merchant, but not the buyers, faced severe penalties including execution. The order did not prohibit traditional medicinal use of opium, which had been practiced for thousands of years in China. This edict or order was in response to report of the significant harm and addiction of opium smoking in some of the remote southern areas influenced by foreign traders in China, where there had been epidemic of lawlessness until well into the 18th century opium smoking remained relatively localized and not taken too seriously by the imperial government. Emperor Yang Cheng's order unfortunately did not have much impact on the opium trade or the growing practice of smoking opium due to a combination of a strong demand, a ready supply and corruption of local officials. About 20 years later, in 1750, the British East India Company assumed control of Bengal and Bihar opium-growing district of India. British shipping dominated the opium trade out of Calcutta in India to China, reinforcing and advocating the use and smoking of opium to Chinese citizens. This is the beginning of opioid addiction and significant change in the history of opioid addiction. While in 1753, Linnaeus, the father of botany, for the first time classified the opium puppy as Papavera somniferum, sleep-inducing puppy in his, in his book. Around the same time, in 1753, a surgeon by the name of George Young wrote, everybody knows a large dose of laudanum will kill, so need not 
be cautioned on that head, but there are few who consider it a, a slow poison, though it is, it certainly is. So clearly the side effects of Lodanum were known by the practitioner of that period. period. Its addictive nature was noticed particularly in women. Dr. J. Hector St. John wrote that taking a dose of opium every morning and so deep-rooted is it that they would be at loss how to live without this indulgence. Despite all of that caution, Lodanum was still prescribed for many painful conditions such as toothache, labor pain, prolapsed hemorrhoids, diarrhea, and cough. At the beginning of this lecture, I said I'm going to talk about some really interesting way how people they got addicted to opium. Here's a short story of power, greed, and corruption which I'm going to be repeating these three words during this, this and the next presentation. Between 1773 and 1786, Warren Hastings, the first governor general of India, a British appointed governor, recognized that opium is harmful to people and at first opposes increasing production of opium, but later he ignored this observation and fact of potential addictive nature of opium, and for financial reason, he actually encouraged the production and control of opium by British-owned company, basically monopolizing supply of op opium. This planned monopoly lasted throughout his administration and beyond, but when the Chinese market was discovered the monopoly shifted from controlling to expanding cultivation. The New York Times in a 2019 article called it the original evil corporation. The East India Company was a trading firm with its own army and was masterful at manipulating governments for its own profit. Hastings Act got millions of people addicted, but made him a fortune. Similar force of power, greed and corruption contributed to creating the current addiction problem, which I'll discuss later. During the American Revolution in 1775, the Continental and British armies using opium to treat sick and wounded soldiers. In fact, opium was a common medical tool while an opium epidemic intensified after the civil war when 10 million prescription pills were given to the Union Army soldiers. Now we can see that substance abuse has been around in the United States since the days of American Revolution. The founding fathers would have been exposed to opioid and alcohol and some of the these famous historical figures, figures depended on, on them for pain relief and emotional comfort. George Washington, the nation's, the nation's first president, may have dental problem. Some say that Washington used the opioid derivative laudanum to help alleviate his discomfort and Benjamin Franklin also took opium late in life to cope with the severe pain from a bladder stone. By 1767, the British East India Company's import of opium to China reached a staggering 2,000 chests of opium per year. In 1793, they continued the monopoly of the opium trade in China. All poppy growers in India were forbidden to sell opium to the competitive trading companies, including the Americans. Once again, in 1799, another Chinese emperor Emperor Kia King attempted to control opium epidemic, banning opium completely, making trade and cultivation of puppies illegal. 20 years later, illegal opium smuggling to China started again. By the 1800s, ether and chloroform were introduced as anesthetic 
for surgery. Some doctors were concerned, however, about the ethics of operating on an unconscious patient. Others suggested that relieving pain might hamper the healing process, but the surgeons could not resist their new ability to perform longer and more complex procedure, and most patients thought anesthesia is a divine blessing. In 1800, the British turned their focus to Europe and America. The British Levant Company purchased nearly half of all the opium coming from Smyrna, Turkey, strictly for importation to Europe and the United States. In 1804, when sitting American Vice President Aaron Burr shot and fatally wounded former Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton, the medication was given to Hamilton was Lodanum to relieve his pain. Hamilton died 33, 31 hours later. Lodanum was the main medication of choice at that time, but the exact amount of opium content in Lodanum that was mixed with alcohol was not precise. Just imagine the f uh, frustration of physicians of 1800 that were responsible for healing the sick and ending suffering, but who were often unsuccessful at both of them because of inaccurate measurement of uh, alcohol and opium. This problem was solved between 1810 to 1824 when Professor Gay Lussac developed a systematic way to measure the mixture of alcohol and opium in Lodanem. Lussac is known mostly for his discovery that water is made of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen, and his work on alcohol-water mixture led, led the, to the degrees Gay Lussac used to measure exact amount of alcohol in Lodanem. In the early 1800, Frederick Sir Tuner witnessed this frustration of physician with Lodanem as a dis disgruntled German teenager, he was forced into a pharmaceutical internship. While doctors exhausted after days and nights of unsuccessful attempt to relieve pain, they blamed pharmacists for the unpredictable quality of opium, and the pharmacists in turn scratched their head and looked to their suppliers. The answer seemed very clear to young Sir Tuner. Though he lacked formal medical or research training, his rational thinking led him to believe that there must be an active ingredient in the opium which, if isolated, could be delivered in a safe, effective, and reliable dose. In an effort to quell this boredom at the pharmacy, Sir Tuner spent his nights using old equipment to run experiment on opium, dissolving it in acid, neutralizing it with ammonia, and precipitating um, various products. His first experiments yielded nothing more than inert compounds, but he was not easily discouraged. At age 21, he isolated what he believed to be the active ingredient, the Principum Somniferum. His discovery contradicted current knowledge at that time because this compound was the first alkaloid ever derived from an opium plant. He conducted many animal experiments with the new compounds, demonstrating both its sedative property and the dangerous consequence that often accompanied them. Sir Tuner initially named the drug Morphos after the Greek god of dream. However, in keeping with the standardized naming of alkaloid, he finally settled on the name morphine. He eagerly submitted his research for publication, but his discovery was labeled unscientific and was not accepted by the medical community. An insulted Sir Tuner set aside his research for years until one evening when a bout of personal pain prompted him to pick up where he had left off. In the midst of a terrible toothache, he took a small amount of his morphine, fell fast asleep, and awoke hours later to attest that this compound was in fact safe for human consumption. He went on to conduct dosing experiments with local children that 
would be frowned upon by even the most relaxed institutional review board today. But that, at the time, indicated he had achieved his goal of discovering a safe, effective, reliable dosing of analgesics. His research was again disregarded when a university experiment in France began to confirm his, set, his result. However, he was ultimately credited with being the discoverer of, the, of morphine. Sir Turner transformed pharmaceutical chemistry from the state of alchemy to an acknowledged branch of science. His discovery enabled physicians to prescribe morphine in regulated dosage for easing pain and also eliminated the danger of overdose associated with raw opium poppy juice. It was only in 1925 that Sir Robert Robinson created the empirical formula for, of morphine and then Marshall D. Gates Jr. synthesized the drug in a laboratory in 1952. The most striking advantage of morphine crystal over opium itself was in the purity and consistency of the potency that could be achieved with morphine. In 1827, E. Merck, a German company, began commercial manufacturing of morphine. Around this time, opium addiction was at its all-time high in England. Many years later, in 1891, Merck opened a pharmaceutical plant in the United States. While working to refine morphine, Pierre-Jean Robiquet, a French chemist, isolated codeine in 1832. He first called it methyl morphine, a naturally occurring alkaloid of opium, but later he named it codeine. The name codeine came from the Greek word that refers to the head of the poppy plant. Codeine also became extremely popular and was used as a pain medication, cough suppressant, and antidiuretic medication as well. Meanwhile, in 1830, Justus von Liebig, a German chemist who is now known as the father of the fertilizer industry because of his significant contribution in that field, began the synthesis of organic molecules, stating that um, the procedure of production of all organic substances no longer belong just to living organism. In 1832, the, he produced chloral hydrate, Although it was not introduced into medicine until 1869, when Matthias uh, Leibrich discovered its effectiveness in, in inducing sleep. Therapeutic dose of chloral hydrate produces a deep sleep lasting f between four to eight hours with few after effects. But habitual use of the drug results in addiction, a fact quickly noted in the medical literature of the 19th and early 20th century. The history of opium war in China is fascinating, sad, and shows how power, greed, and corruption made millions of people addicted. The Chinese had almost no contact with the rest of the world for many, many years. The Chinese government only allowed trading to take place at one port, port of Canton. To get around this problem, British merchants began to smuggle opium into the country, so the Chinese were forced into trading with them. The immediate issue in 1839 was that Chinese officials seized and burned 20,000 chests of opium uh, stocks at Canton to stop the banned opium trades to control the devastating effect of opium addiction in China and threatening the death penalty for future offenders. In respond, response, the British sent warship which threatened the Chinese and besieged the port. From 1839 to 1842, the first opium war, also known as the Anglo-Chinese War, was fought, was fought. Greed, not humanity, was now in full play by British merchants. 
the British government insisted on the principle of free trade and equality amongst nation, nations and backed the merchants' demand. The British Navy defeated the Chinese using technologically superior ships and weapons, and the British then imposed a treaty that granted territory to Britain and opened trade with China. Finally, in 1842, the Treaty of Nanjing was signed. This treaty ended the First Opium War and was the first of the lopsided treaties between China and foreign imperialist power. China paid the British an indemnity, ceded the territory of Hong Kong, and agreed to establish a fair and reasonable tariff. British merchant who had previously been allowed to trade only at Canton, now were permitted to trade at five treaty ports and with whomever they planned. The treaty was supplemented in 1843, a treaty that allowed British citizens to be tried in British court and granted Britain any rights in China that China might grant to other countries. A truly lopsided Treaty. Treaty. Meanwhile, in 1849, Mrs. Winslow's syrup was advertised as a miracle drug, a mother's friend, and a soothing syrup for children's children teething. This miraculous drug, however, had 65 mg of morphine sulfate per fluid ounce, sodium carbonate, and liquid, liquid ammonia. This was no miracle. Twenty years later, in an 1864 post, an article was published. The author described the desperate state of children daycare working women might have. That's what they say. They said in the article, working women might leave their children with elderly caretakers who dose their children with morphine so they would remain quiet and manageable. It was marketed to parents as a perfectly harmless and pleasant a way to produce a natural quiet sleep by relieving the children from pain. Parents didn't realize the syrup contained morphine and unfortunately Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup was allegedly responsible for the death of many babies. Back in China, British opium traders were still at work. The second major opium war that lasted from 1856 to 1860 fought over issues relating to exportation of opium to China and resulted in a second defeat for the Qing dynasty. It was also known as the Second Anglo-Chinese War, the Arrow War, or the Anglo-French Expedition to China. Once again, it was a war pitting the British and the French Empire against the Qing dynasty of China. This time, millions of Chinese people got addicted to and many lost their lives to opium addiction. However, in Europe, it was in 1853 that the face of opioid use and even the medical field changed altogether. A Scottish doctor, Alexander Wood, invented for the first time hollow needle and syringe. But Wood needed uh, to test his device on someone. Whom should he pick to do the test run and in inject morphine? He chose his wife. He injected morphine to himself and to his wife, an experiment that led to his wife's death. Mrs. Wood is the first woman on record to die of an accidental injectable form of drug overdose. Dr. Wood survived probably because he could not give the deadly dose of morphine to himself. So he continued his experiment with other candidates and he discovered that the effect of morphine on the patient using injection technique was many times more effective and efficient and potent than taking it by mouth. Physicians started using morphine as a new fangled wonder drug. Injected with a hypodermic syringe, the medication relieved pain, asthma, headache, alcohol, alcoholic delirium treatment. 
gastrointestinal diseases and menstrual cramp. Doctors were really impressed by the speed of the result they got, said David Courtright, author of The Dark Paradise, A History of Opiate Addiction in America. And he continued to say, it is almost as if someone had handed them a magic wand. In an 1880 medical text titled The Hypodermic Injection of Morphia, the author stated that here is no proceeding in, medica- in medicine that has become so rapidly popular, no method of allying pain so prompt in its action and permanent in its effect. No plan of medication that has been so carelessly used and thoroughly abused, and no therapeutic discovery that has been so great a blessing and so great a curse to mankind than the hypodermic injection of morphia. After the invention of the hypodermic syringe, Americans' opium addiction reached new catastrophic height and a stigma developed surrounding its use. In 1860, after the Second Opium War ended in China, thousands of Chinese immigrated to America to work on railroad and the California's gold field during the 1849 gold rush. They brought with them the habit of opium smoking and in 1860 introduced that to America. They soon established opium dens, places to buy and sell and smoke opium in so-called Chinatowns throughout the West. By the middle of 19th century, recreational opiate use was becoming more common. Most Americans didn't need an opium den, however, to get their fixed. By then, opiate were the main ingredient in everything from teething pow- powders to analgesic for menstrual cramp. By the 1870s, opium smoking had become a popular habit for many Americans, and in 1875, San Francisco became the first city to pass legislation trying to limit opium use. The ordinance made it a misnomer to maintain a f- or frequent an opium den. These concerns and fears of unemployment among white Americans f- fed into an anti-Chinese campaign that led to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, a 10-year moratorium on Chinese immigration. Civil war, which lasted from 1861 until 1865, helped to set off America's opium epidemic. The Union Army alone issued nearly 10 million opium pills to its soldiers, plus 2.8 million ounces of opium powder and tincture. There were about 620,000 recorded military dead in civil war, about two-thirds died from diseases, and many injured and in need of pain medication. An unknown number of soldiers returned home addicted or with wars, war wounds that opium relieved. Even if disabled soldiers survived the war without becoming addicted, there was a good chance that soldiers would later meet up with a hypodermic yielding um, physician. In addition to laudanum and opium pill, morphine became the mainstay of US doctors for treating pain, anxiety, and respiratory problems. The hypodermic syringe widely used to deliver morphine by the 1870s played an even greater role in drug addictions. Doctors and patients alike were tempted to overdose. By 1880, practically every American physician owned a syringe and a new ability to give morphine injection with its powerful and rapid effect on pain relief and euphoria transformed medical practice. Then, in the post-Civil War years, opiate use rose sharply. Many wounded veterans who would be given the painkillers in military hospitals became lifelong Um, addicts 
Between 1861 and 1865, post-war morphine addicts and addiction became known as soldier's disease. But there was even greater use among civilians, some of whom become addicted when trying to escape the pain of chronic illnesses, even bankruptcy and unemployment, or the death of a loved one. This heavy use of morphine and laudanum caused the death of thousands, and deliberate overdosing became the most common means of suicide. Opium pills were also widely displaced or dispensed when hypodermic needles were unavailable. A textbook of medicine in 1880 listed 54 diseases that could be treated with morphine injection, ranging from anemia and angina, even for insanity, diabetes, tetanus, vomiting of pregnancy, and ovarian neuralgia, and so on. By the 19th century, God's own medicine had collapsed into a full-blown epidemic with the rate of addiction three times as high as the 1990s heroin crisis. The search for the next miracle drug continued, so chemist or f- pharmacist, also known as druggist, of that period started to search for a better solution, and cocaine was discovered as the next miraculous medicine. It was sometimes between 1859 and 1860 that a German scientist by the name of Albert Niemann isolated the active ingredient derived from coca leaves for the first time and he called it cocaine. He died the next year, apparently after his experiments developing mustard gas. After his death, his colleague Wilhelm Lawson continued his investigation and identified the proper chemical formula of cocaine in 1862. He did this by dissolving leaves of coca in hydrochloric acid, forming a water-soluble salt, then letting it dry and creating a white powder or crystal. By now, I hope you learned a few new points about the history of discovery, discovery of opioids and how from opium puppy, how many different derivatives were discovered so far. But after Albert Niemann's discovery and his death of experimental mustard gas that he developed, the whole world changed. And in the part two, you would see how mustard gas changed the way that medicine is practiced at current time. I look forward to see you on the second part of this presentation. Thank you.